Amen. All right. Okay, let's see here. So, playing God. This is something that I've been looking at for some time. And it's, it's interesting, you know, that there's a lot going on. Uh, you probably have noticed this. Um, anybody that's got their eyes open at all nowadays, you can tell there's this so much happening uh, in a way that it wasn't happening before. It's in your face. <laughs> um, the whole trans thing. Now, we're to love people. We're to love people as Jesus loves people. Amen? And we, we shouldn't care what their orientation is, what their background, what their uh, race is. None of that matters. Every person is in need of the grace of, of the Lord. And we should view them that way and reach out to them and help them. But this trans thing is really getting out of whack. It's, uh, it's becoming violent in some cases. Uh, you probably have uh, heard about Disney in Florida. Uh, you know, this whole Disney is not the same Disney it used to be. <laughs> it's, it used to be just magic and flying elephants and... <laughs> You know, things like that, it, 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 it was, there, there was magic, no doubt, but in fantasy, which isn't all the best. But now it's a lot different. Uh, even the, the show Elemental, that's a brand new movie, even that has a non-binary uh, person in it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just, there's a grooming of children going on that is evil. It's absolutely evil. And it's coming from places you would not expect it to come from, like Disney and, and the Dodgers and <laughs> White House. I mean, come on. It's, it's just in our face. Uh, of course, Florida, Disney was thinking of, you know, we need to move. And, and North Carolina was say, hey, come up here. <laughs> come move uh, Disney, Disney World up here. It's just been a mess. And, you know, I congratulate Florida. Now, they've gotten a lot of flack about this, you know, people have, have thought of DeSantis and all those people as, as just ultra right wing whack jobs, but you know, they have convictions, you know, they, they do, they have convictions and they're trying to protect children. And when is that a bad idea, you know? Uh, protecting kids, I like that. Um, and so I'm glad they spoke up. The Dodgers, of course, you know, they've gotten the, the drag queens out there, uh, and they've been dressed in nuns' outfits, and it's just not a good situation. Uh, if you've seen that, it, it just, it's very unnerving, um, and thousands of kids are watching this, you know, and drag queens. Uh, what does that have to do with professional baseball, you know? Um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in our face. You Bud Light, uh, hopefully you don't know a whole lot of Bud Light. Uh, back in the day, Bud Light and me were buddies, but not these days. No, no, no. No, no. But Dylan Mulvaney is a, a trans uh, actress, um, VIP, and of course, you probably are aware of what happened with that. <laughs> Uh, you know, promoting Bud Light in a commercial, and their sales have plummeted as a result. Um, people are not too uh, uh, hip on this idea. They don't really like it uh, when you're mixing all of that with everyday things, you know. It, it's in your face. It's everywhere. It, it's it's, it's Sodom and Gomorrah 2, you know. It's a sequel. <laughs> And so it's not just Florida and Disney and Elemental and, and the Dodgers and Bud Light. There's a proposed California bill, and this bill um, is, looks like AB 957 if is what it's called. It's proposed by a Democratic Assembly member, Lori Wilson, and State Senator Scott Weiner. But uh, this bill would brand parents abusive if they refuse to affirm their transgender children's identity and let social workers take youngsters into care. Uh, think about that. Uh, that's not just overreach. That is, that's evil. Let's just say it for what it is. I mean, that is just plain evil. Um, 
little kids are trying to understand life and figure out who they are and who the world is, and, and it's a scary place in lots of ways, but, you know, uh, they're not able quite yet, you know, they're still learning. They shouldn't be able to say, I feel like being a female, or I feel like being a male, or whatever. Uh, no, that's, that's playing God, actually, and parents do have rights, I believe, uh, and you probably do too. Parents do have considerable rights. Those rights need to be maintained. Um, but California, they're not. Daily Mail by Hope Sloop. A proposed amendment to a bill in California would classify parents who refuse to affirm their child's gender as abusive and could result in revoked custody. They can take your kids away in California. So let's see here, addresses the health, safety, and welfare of the child in every household. If passed, this law could see children pulled from their parents' home if their family members have the state uh, deem them as anti-LGBTQ plus uh, in their approach. So now, that's scary. That's scary right there. Uh, you know, you're just trying to be a godly parent and raise your kids uh, with good morals and good principles and, and uh, the social work comes along, knocks on the door with a couple of police officers behind her and says, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to take your kids. Pretty scary, pretty scary. That is in your face. That is playing God, choosing or changing one's gender. That's playing God. And playing God is a dangerous matter. All right, the actual incidences of trans, you may be interested to know, is just a little bit over 3% in, in the population. It's not that large. You wouldn't know that because trans stuff is everywhere. Everybody and their grandma is embracing it, all companies. There are major companies that are embracing this trans thing. Um, it's only about 3%. Incidence of hermaphroditism, that's a hard word to say. And that's where an individual has both male and, and, and uh, female characteristics when they're born. Uh, that sometimes happens. And I say, as a counselor, if that happens, the parents have the right to choose what is more prominent uh, for that young'un and do whatever corrective surgery is needed early on it's far less damaging emotionally and otherwise to that young person if it happens early. So by the time they hit their teens, they're well established in that gender uh, formation. So that's how you do that. That's, that's a godly way of doing it. But the incidences of that, having both characteristics, it's only 1.7%. That's it. It's extremely low. But you would think that this is happening all over the place. You know, because it's in our face. It's everywhere. And I don't like that. I don't like that, that they're making this appear like it's 70% instead of 1.7%, you know? No, no. There's simple answers to some of these things. Now, God's plan. <coughs> God's plan. Uh, I like this. And, you know, I was thinking about this, putting this message together. And I know what I believe I know what I believe about these things. Um, I know what the Bible says about these things. Uh, and I wonder, does the Adventist church have an official statement on these matters? And sure enough, they do. All right, this is from Adventist.org. I like this a lot. I really like, this is balanced. This is Christ-like, okay? This is nice. All right, biblical principles relating to sexuality and transgender phenomenon. Number one, and I'll just summarize these, God created humanity. Well, there you go. You say that, and immediately you're outcast and you're blacklisted. Uh, but God created humanity as two persons who are respectively identified as male and female in terms of gender. The Bible inextricably ties gender to biological sex in Genesis 1.27 and 2, verses 22 to 24. It's right there and does not make a distinction between the two. And by the way, he created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? All right, so 
Uh, the Word of God affirms complementarity as well as clear distinctions between male and female in creation. The Genesis creation account is foundational to all questions of human sexuality. So that's your starting point, but most of these people who are promoting trans and everything and, and do your own thing, uh, be your own God, uh, playing God, um, they would throw that idea out immediately. They don't even start there. They say, no, 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 there are a plethora of gender expressions and identities. Dozens. <laughs> All right, in the Bible, there's two. There's two. And if there were two males back then or two females back then that he created, we wouldn't be here. Nobody would have ever been anywhere. There would have been no propagation of the human race at all. So if they would just stop and think about that. Number two, from a biblical perspective, the human being is a psychosomatic unity. For example, Scripture repeatedly calls the entire human being a soul. You've heard that expression that, oh, 50 souls were lost. You know, this horrible thing that just happened. You know, five individuals, of course, lost their lives on this little mini sub that was exploring the Titanic wreck. You probably heard about that. Very tragic. It apparently imploded. And that's a high-risk activity. That's not the kind of thing I would go for, just like I wouldn't jump out of a perfectly good airplane. You know, I, uh, I might. I just might. I just might. But... Um, I probably definitely wouldn't scale Yosemite, you know, I'm not into that kind of thing. Anything high risk like that, where just like that, you can lose, lose your life, I'm not usually into that kind of thing. I care more about life than that. Uh, but we're a unity. Uh, it, we're a soul. It's all over the Bible. I mean, there's dozens of scriptures that talk about this unity of who we are. Um, the Bible does not endorse dualism in the sense of a separation between one's body and one's sense of sexuality. They're one and the same in the Bible. Okay? And in addition, an immortal part of humans is not envisioned in Scripture because God alone possesses immortality. First Timothy 6 tells us that. And will bestow it on those who believe in him at the first resurrection. First Corinthians, Corinthians 15 tells us that very plainly. Thus, a human being is also meant to be an undivided sexual entity. A sexual identity cannot be independent from one's body. According to Scripture, a gender identity, as designed by God, is determined by our biological sex at birth. It's in Genesis, it's in Psalm 139, Mark 10, it's all over. You are, your identity is the same as your sex at birth. Okay, three, scripture acknowledges, however, due to, the, due to the fall, the whole human being, that is our mental, physical, and spiritual faculties, are affected by sin. There's no doubt about that. Every part of us is, has been impacted by sin. We get tired. Uh, we could become ill at times. Um, we age. All of that is an evidence of the existence of sin in this world. And our federal, the federal heads of our human race, Adam and Eve, they put this upon the whole uh, human race. We're born with a natural inclination to sin. And not just an inclination to sin, but an inclination to age and all the above. Yeah. All right. We need guidance from God through Scripture to determine what is our best, in our best interest and live according to His will. Number four. I like this. It's very succinct. The fact that some individuals claim gender identity incompatible with their biological sex reveals a serious dichotomy. Yeah, I would say that's the case. This brokenness or distress, whether felt or not, is an expression of the damaging effects of sin on humans and may have a variety of causes. <coughs> Although gender dysphoria is not intrinsically sinful, it may result in sinful choices. It is another indicator that on the personal level, humans are involved in the great controversy. I like that. As long as trans, this is five, as long as transgender people are committed to ordering their lives according to the biblical teachings on sexuality and marriage, they could be members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bible clearly consistently identifies any sexual activity outside of heterosexual marriage as sin. That's all over the pages of Scripture, that concept. 
Alternative sexual lifestyles are sinful distortions of God's good gift of sexuality. Six, because the Bible regards humans as holistic entities that does not differentiate between biological sex and gender identity, the church strongly cautions transgender people against sex reassignment surgery and against marriage. If they have undergone such a procedure, they have, if they have undergone such a procedure from the biblical uh, holistic viewpoint of human nature, a full transition from one gender to another and the attainment of an integrated sexual identity cannot be expected in the case of sex reassignment surgery. Just because you have a, a plumbing change doesn't necessarily mean you've changed anything, really. You know, it's just, it's, it's playing God is what it is. Number eight, the church as a community of Jesus Christ is meant to be a refuge, amen, and a place of hope, care, and understanding to all who are perplexed, suffering, struggling, and lonely, for a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. Matthew twelve twenty. That's how Jesus related to people. He hung up with some of the m- most severe rejects of society on a regular basis, and thought nothing of it. That's how he rolled, and I like that. That's the heart of God, right there. He cares about the person. He doesn't get all wrapped up in the in the packaging. Okay. He cares about the heart of that person and the destiny of that person, and so should we. All right. All right, all right, all right. All people are invited into the Adventist Church Fellowship. All right. Number nine, the Bible proclaims good news that sexual sins committed by heterosexuals, homosexuals, transgender people, or others can be forgiven and lives could be transformed through faith in Christ. And ten, those who experience incongruity between their biological sex and gender identity are encouraged to follow biblical principles in dealing with their distress. They're invited to reflect on God's original plan of purity and sexual fidelity. All right, I like that. That is our church's position. It is a balanced uh, position. It is, it is good. And I can say amen to it. I like it because it's, it's upholding biblical principles Let's simplify here. It's male, female, try not to play God and, and, and do something different than that, okay? Or change what you are. Learn to be comfortable in your own shoes, amen? Uh, don't play God. Playing God is, mm, no, it's not going to work. Uh, you're not going to have much of a future when you play God. All right. All right, let's see. Yeah. So that's God's plan. That's what he says about that. Trans and, and, you know, uh, LGBTQ, all of the pluses, it's growing every week, it seems. Plus, 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 plus. (laughs) Um, It's all out of God's will, you know, theologically, from the biblical perspective. We need to love them, though, just as Christ loves them. We need to wrap our arms around them and, and, and... have a ministry of presence in their lives so that we can reach out to those felt needs, what they're dealing with, and then they'll be much more likely to trust us and have Bible studies and and learn the truth for these last days. Uh, It's a personal touch. It really is. That's the only thing that's ever worked. Christ's method alone, that's what works. So we don't need to improve on it. All right. Self-will, that's what we're talking about here. Self-will, that's what's involved in playing God. Now, Sean Brunster, Pastor Brunster, last week, if you heard his message, oh, it was a good message. I like that message. That guy has energy. <laughs> he has a, he's always had energy. He, he's, he's gotten quicker and, and sharper as he's grown, it seems, you know. But um, he made this point that when self is on the throne, we need to get self off the throne, We need to let God be God in our lives, okay? So what's going to save us, what's going to save us, my brother, my sister, is not theory. Uh, It's good to know the doctrines. It's good to know truth. It's good to let um, the Bible explain itself, be its own interpreter, compare Scripture with Scripture. That's the, the guidance we've been given. But that understanding and that uh Education is not what actually saves us. Now, it's going to safeguard us. 
Oh yeah, it's going to safeguard us. We're going to be able to make reasoned, intelligent, godly decisions when the time comes. Oh sure. So we need to know the word. It is a light unto our path. Amen? Amen. But what actually saves us is a loving, trusting relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, who is the author of Scripture. He is the author and finisher of our faith, and that's what we need for the last days. The song, In the Garden, I've always liked that song because it, it kind of encapsulates what that walk can be like. It could be joyous and wonderful. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Oh, the joy that fills my heart. See, that, is a, that can be a daily experience for us, and we need that. We desperately need that daily walk with Christ. That will safeguard us against self-will and playing God right there. That is the only thing that will safeguard us and protect us against self-will and playing God, right there. That strong connection with the Lord Jesus and listening to every word that comes out of his mouth, that's his word, and talking and responding to him, that's prayer. Prayer, prayer plus word equals abide. Always remember that. Prayer plus word equals abide. And he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, <laughs> You're going to live forever. That's what he says. <laughs> I'm just summarizing what he says, but that's what he says. All right. In the garden. Sometimes, you know, and I like our, our passage here that was uh, read earlier from Jeremiah. We do two things, okay? And, and this is happening large scale in our world right now. People are forsaking God. They're forsaking the very source of life. They're just writing him off. And when you write God off, you are turning your back on life itself. Okay? Broken cisterns. And on top of it, we're coming up with new sources of life that we think will see us through, think will help us survive, help us to get by. And, or as one of my clients recently said, when I asked, because I always ask uh, in, in the intake session, and I say, you're only going to hear this once, so just bear with me. The spiritual slash religious slash metaphysical slash om part of life, what does that area of life mean to you personally? And I get all kinds of answers, as you could imagine. And one person said recently, oh, I don't know, uh, never thought about it. I guess nirvana. <laughs> I guess nirvana, uh, you know, uh, oneness, or I don't know, I guess, uh, yeah. <laughs> the whole concept of nirvana is, is um, plagued with, with uh, intrinsic holes in it. Uh, it's just, uh, no. There is no utopia here. This world is fading fast. It's fading fast. I have another client who regularly talks with entities from other worlds and spiritual forces in high places. And I'm trying to help her understand, and, and she does have psychosis, but um, this is beyond psychosis. This is beyond schizophrenia. This is a spiritual phenomenon uh, that she's dealing with, okay? And, and it's a perfect example how, how one's belief system can set a person up for disaster, you know? If your beliefs are all out of kilter and they're, they're just all wrong and, 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 and out of place and incorrect, your whole life is going to go in that direction. You're going to be all confused. You're going to be incorrect. You're going to be building broken cisterns. Yeah, we do that. These cisterns don't last. They break down. They start shedding water. They do not last. We need to get back to God and let God be God and quit playing God. <laughs> Try that. Yeah, now that is what works right there. Self-will. So... Samson comes to mind. If you could turn in your Bible with me to Judges, the book of Judges in the Old Testament, chapter 13. Chapter 13. One of my favorite characters, um, a, a, an incredible individual, Samson. Um, oh, what potential. 
<laughs> what power, <laughs> you know? What guy does it uh, admire Samson, you know? Want to be like Samson, you know? Incredible might. Now, Samson was a Nazarite. He, he is like a forerunner of John the Baptist, very similar. Uh, similar vows, similar upbringing, etc. Um, very careful. And there's so many parallels here between Samson and John the Baptist. I don't have time to get into it, but uh, yet another, uh, you know, uh, Manoah's wife, Samson's mother, was barren. And so this was a miracle. This was a supernatural, this was a God thing, okay? 13, Judges 13, starting with verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. Now, mind you, the, the setting of this, okay, so Judah, Judah, the people of God, they have turned their backs on God multiple times, and every time they do that, the Lord allows one of the people warring facts, fact, you know, fashion out there, groups, nations out there, in this case, the Philistines, to attack and to, you know, uh, so they come to their senses, okay? So that's what happens with us, too. He allows certain things to come into our lives that really cause us to think, how did I get into this mess? Wow. How can I get out of it? Wow. So that's what was happening, uh, and the Philistines were over them at this time, okay? And they are not very nice people, you probably imagined. All right, she bear not. Verse three, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine or strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for lo, Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto the God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So this was an incredible beginning point for Samson, okay? An incredible beginning point. And, you know, if he... I've got to grab... Good old patriarchs and prophets here. It could have been wonderful. It could have been incredible. He could have been uh, one of the finest judges of Israel's history. He could have done so much more if he hadn't played God. I'm reading from Patriarchs and Prophets 562, 563, right in there. Here's what the servant of the Lord said. Had Samson obeyed the divine commands as faithfully as his parents had done, he would have been a nobler and his would have been a nobler and happier destiny. But association, and uh, Justin, you were talking about this a little bit ago. I like it. The Lord works in mysterious ways. He blends it all together. Combined message, and and Tracy, oh, everything just flows together. That's the Lord's orchestration right there. All right, so um, association with idolaters corrupted him. Be careful here who you hang with. Be careful, yeah. The, power, the town of Zorah being near the country of the Philistines, Samson came to mingle with them on friendly terms. Mm, there's nothing so bad about that, right? We're supposed to mingle in, in, in uh, you know, Christ's method alone, right? But he didn't just do that. Uh, he really mingled. Uh, all right. So, yeah. Thus, in his youth, intimacies sprang up, the influence of which darkened his whole life. A young woman dwelling in the Philistine town of Timnath engaged Samson's affections, and he determined to make her his wife. To his God-fearing parents, who endeavored to dissuade him from this his purpose. His only answer was, she pleaseth me well. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh, bring me woman now. You know, it's whatever. You know, it's macho. You know. The parents at last 
you tell you could tell this was a process. <laughs> it went back and forth quite a while. At last, they yielded to his wishes, and the marriage took place. And then she makes this these points very interesting. Just as he was entering upon manhood, the time when he must execute his divine mission, because God had a plan for young Samson. Uh, he was going to be a mover and shaker. He was going to be strong. His hair was growing. Uh, he, uh, he was going to be a, a force to be reckoned with. He was going to start turning the tide against the Philistines. And so, just as he was entering manhood, the time when he must execute his divine mission, the time above all others, when he should have been true to God, on all how it would have been different for him if he had been true to God. Samson connected himself with the enemies of Israel. He did not ask whether he could be better he could better glorify God when united with the object of his choice or whether he was placing himself in a position where he could not fulfill the purpose to be accomplished in his life. Hmm. He didn't ask that question. He didn't say, you know, Lord, I'm thinking about this. What say you? What do you think? No, that wasn't, that's not what he did. No. To all who seek first to honor him, God has promised wisdom. But there is no promise to those who are bent upon self-pleasing. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So, yeah. So, he's mingling and he's marrying. And, you know, a lot goes on. I'm not going to read you know, all these uh, chapters, you know kind of probably what happens with Samson. Amazing things happen in spite of his <laughs> playing God. Uh, the jawbone of an ass, he kills like, what, 300? <laughs> uh, he carries a big old, huh? Thousands. Thousands, yeah, jawbone of an ass. The foxes, oh, it's just 300 foxes. Yeah, he tied 300 of them together, a lantern, a fire, you know, a torch in their tail, and they just destroyed the, the entire crops of the Philistines. He just did mischief against the Philistines. Um, wow. He, he was, he was uh, oh, it, it goes on and on. He did so many things to the Philistines. Oh, wow. And his first wife died because, you know, of his, you know, silliness, really foolishness, you know. So, so remember now, he's a Nazarite. Nazarites are not supposed to drink alcohol. They're supposed to let their hair grow. They're supposed to uh, be strong and they're, they're, to avoid immorality and that type of thing. They're supposed to do things the right way, God's way. Uh, and they're not supposed to let the world become a part of them, but they're supposed to reach out and try to change their world. Samson's Samson blew it on all those accounts. He married a non, uh, you know, uh, child of God, non-Israelite. Uh, he drank, he, well, he, just, he just did a lot to, to nullify his Nazarite vows. Didn't help himself. She died. She was killed by the Philistines. They were mad at her. So he lost that. And then later, you know, like uh, Tina Turner sang many years ago, Samson and Delilah. Yep, he got together with Delilah. Uh, that was a big mistake. That was a huge mistake. He's just making it even worse. He's, he's piling wrong on top of wrong, mistake on top of mistake, further and further removed from God's will. And it's getting worse and worse. And he's just playing with her. It just, you know, she, she's not a friendly Delilah. She's not a friendly no, no, no. She's trying to find out the secret of his power, you know, because the Philistines are trying to use her. She's not very nice, you know. And he plays with her. She's trying to butter him up, and, and there's alcohol, and there's all kinds of things happening. And it's not a good uh, situation. You know what happens. You know what happens. He tells him the truth. Okay. All right. You, if you cut my hair, my power will leave me. And that's exactly what happens. And they come in. They cut off a bunch of locks of hair. 
And uh, he thinks, oh, I can just get away like I always get away, because he was a powerful dude, Samson. Uh, he was he was like uh, Bruce Willis and and The Rock and Terminator all thrown together. He was a quite a quite a dude, but not this time. Not this time. No. And the Bible says they captured him. They took him away. Judges sixteen twenty one. <clears throat> but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass. Now, back in the day, that wouldn't have been, that would be easy. Yeah, fetters of brass, hey, put several. Boom, I'm out of here. <laughs> Not this time, no. He had forsaken God, and the symbol of Samson's consecration and vows to God, his hair, he gave it away. He just gave it away. Like uh, Esau gave away his, was it Esau? Yeah, gave away his birthright. Birthright. Yep, just gave it away. Took him down the fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. So here's Samson, the mighty Samson. And by the way, he judged Israel for 20 years. <laughs> you know, he had a career going. Okay, this was, this took time. All of these things took time. Uh, but it goes by just like that, doesn't it? 20 years. So here he is. He can't see, he's weak, uh, he, he's, you know, he's just a mess. And he's sad, he's depressed, you know, and he's walking around. I don't know if there's room here. I'll just do it right here. So here he is. He's grinding this millstone. Round and round he goes, round and round. He can't see, he doesn't have to see because, you know, you just keep moving. That's all you got to do, keep moving, you know. So he's moving. And he's grinding, and they're laughing at him. They're scoffing. They're scoffing. They're saying, oh, what a joke. Look at this guy. What a weakling. What a joke, you know. And his God is a joke, too. They're saying all kinds of mean things about Samson. And, you know, it's very, very ugly. And he, it, you know, he's just miserable. He's just miserable. And he's saying, I did it my way. I did it my way. Yeah. I did it my way. Oh, boy. Did it my way. And you know, after a while, like the old song, I did it my way. He uh, he said, Lord, yeah, I've blown it. I've blown it big time, Lord. He had real repentance going on, thankfully. And I believe we'll see Samson in heaven. Yeah, I want to shake his hand. Yeah. Hopefully he won't squeeze too hard. Yeah. So he said, Lord, let me avenge these uh, people. Let me honor your name. Let me one more time uh, do your will. Let me, I pray thee, destroy these evildoers who are blaspheming your name. And the Lord allows them to do that. And they're having a huge feast to the god Dagon. Uh, Dagon's going to be gone pretty soon. And he says, it's just let me, he tells a servant, let me just, you know, stand up here to support myself here. Because they're all laughing at him. Thousands of people out there watching, laughing, jeering, you know, and they're worshiping Dagon, the fish god or whatever. And, and you know what happens. He is able, and the, the power, his hair is growing back. <laughs> his hair is growing back, symbolic of his vow and his consecration to God and power. It's coming back, and God answers his prayer, and you know what happens? He pushes, and the entire structure of everything, that whole temple and all, everything around it, crumbles. Of course, Samson dies. Everyone dies. And the Bible says he killed more in his death than in his entire life. So what a powerful ending. You might as well uh, finish strong, right? <laughs> but... We need to be careful and learn from this. We should be saying, I did it his way. When all is said and done, when we're coming to the end, we need to be able to say, you know, I had my moments, yeah. I'm not perfect, but I did it his way. I did it his way. I got self off the throne. I stopped playing God. I stopped playing God. 
I'm walking and talking with the Lord. All is well. All is well. I'm not playing God anymore. Nothing comes of that. Nothing. Let God be God. 